Hi, I'm Chelsea Laliberte Barnes. I am the executive director of Live for Lolly. We're a nonprofit organization based in Arlington Heights, Illinois. And I'm here today so excited and grateful to be sitting next to LaShawn Ford, asking him a bunch of really tough questions. Well, let's see. Thanks for coming to the west side of Chicago from the suburbs. I like it here. I don't think you know that I like it I, here. I, I know you like it because you come a lot. Yeah. So and it's clear that, you know, you were excited when you got out of your car. So I know you yeah. like it and you're not getting paid to do this. So you're coming here because this is something that you believe in. So thank you. That's true. Not technically. Well, but, not right. technically. Right. I mean, you didn't have to do this no. today. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so glad that right. you allowed us yes. to come here. A lot of people don't know that people who look like me coming here from the suburbs, I spent three years um, helping Chicago Recovery Alliance and they were relatively unknown before we really had capitalized on trying to get people to understand the heroin crisis. I had spent a lot of time on those buses getting to know the people in this community. You know what? I'm so happy you said heroin crisis because okay. so often people say opioid crisis and we know heroin is an opioid, but people understand that people in on the west side of Chicago, in Chicago, are overdosing off of heroin with the fentanyl lace heroin and now it's like anything you buy on the street is right. potentially laced with fentanyl and and you know the reason why i say that i'm glad you said heroin because the national attention is on opioid right and that's why it's so good that you said heroin because you know even people in the suburbs that come to the west side of chicago they're not dying of opioid pills right they're really dying of fentanyl lace heroin right so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that yeah. narrative needs to be completely reframed. Yes. And so one of our goals at Live for Lolly is to make sure that that happens because we have now completely shifted from a prescription pill yes. frame and a white yes. upper middle class suburban kid frame, much like my brother's story, to now it, anybody is affected. In it. And it's been happening in urban communities where black and brown men and women are being affected by this at rates that the media is not showcasing. Right. So, so, but I'm here today and we'll have to do a quick apology to everybody because LaShawn's so cool. His <laughs> office is bustling and it's really loud in here, yes. but we're going to give it our all and just try to just carry on with the conversation. Yes. So I came here and you agreed to do this because I wanted to really address some tough topics. I wanted to address race. I wanted to address gun violence and the stop and frisk yes. conversations that we're having. So first, you know, LaShawn, first of all, you have been a member of the House of Representatives since 2007. So, yes. Representing the 8th District, which is the west side. That's right. The west side of Chicago, Oak Park, Berwyn, LaGrange, LaGrange Park, North Riverside, and parts of Proviso. Right. So that's a pretty diverse mm -hmm. kind of just broad area. Right. So you, so what a lot of people don't know you, what I didn't know about you is you're a realtor, yes, former history teacher, former basketball coach, and you are on a lot of charity boards. Yes. You do a lot for your community. Yes. I want to know where you grew up, a little bit about you and your background, and why you wanted to become a congressman. Yeah. So I grew up right in, uh, I was born in Cabrini. That's the housing mm -hmm. project over on um, Chicago Avenue down there where it's so expensive to live right now. And then we moved right here where we're at. So I moved here when I was two years old in the Austin community. So right over here at LeClaire and Chicago Avenue, just steps away from where we're doing this podcast. And um, went to school right in this community, a Catholic school, uh, went to Catholic high school, went to the seminary for a year. Then I decided to be a teacher, a real estate broker, and then ended up being a... Um, a state representative. Wow. Yeah. And you've been a state representative almost 10 years now. Yeah, it's over 10 years. It's um, it, it, almost 12 years. Okay. And what, what has that been like, this transition for over the last yeah. 10 years? What's that been like? It's different than a, leaving the private life full time to work as a um, legislator because you don't have total control over the process. You don't have total control over the process of anything, but it's a little easier when you're writing checks to get things done in the private sector. And if you say you want to make something happen in the private sector, you write the check, you could do it. Well, in government, it's not that easy. And I think what we've seen with the current situations where we have a billionaire president, we have a multimillionaire governor in Illinois, they wanted to impose their agendas on 
on the electric, but they can't do it because people have check over the government. And so people have to realize that no matter how um, big uh, President Trump is, no matter how strong um, President Trump is and how strong the um, governor of Illinois is with their money, the people have more power than that money if they come together. And so I say that you say, how did it, how did it transition? So it's tough because we know that there are some things that should be happening in society and progress just takes so long because not everybody can agree. Well, What's good for the west side of Chicago may not be good for the suburbs in the outer parts of Chicago. But you represent the west side of Chicago. You don't represent the suburbs. Just yeah, you I don't do. care. Yeah. Right? You represent everybody. I, right? No, but literally my district is Chicago's Austin community, Oak Park, Berwyn, LaGrange, LaGrange Park, North Riverside, and Proviso. So we have a very diverse district, and the, the issues are different. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But everyone has When you has say that problems. with LaGrange, with Berwyn, with, these are a lot of cusp areas right. right on the border of the city. That's right. And one of the things in working, you know, obviously across the state on issues with addiction and overdose, I've learned is that, you know, no matter where you are in Cook County, it's really, really hard to organize around any of these right. these issues. But what I think is interesting, what you said when you were talking about the, you know, what's happened over the last 10 years. So you have a situation now where you are, we are riding on the coattails of just having President Barack Obama in office. This movement of hope and change has now almost come to a complete blistering halt. And you have a new president in office who has been unabashedly very clear that he isn't so sure, and maybe a lot of his party might not be so sure, that they are all in favor of this hope and change and promoting diversity. And it's been really clear and abundant in that way. How do you think that that has happened? And how do you think that's had an impact on race relations across this country? Yeah, you know, with President Obama's hope and change, I think that that was something that people felt and feel that it was a failure. Mm -hmm. Because there were a lot of people, Republicans, that crossed over to vote for President Obama with the hope that their communities would change. So it wasn't just the black communities that had hope for change. It was the rural areas of this country, all over the country, that ordinarily would never have voted for a black man for president that said, you know, it was so bad under the Bush administration, our country went down the wrong path. President Obama or then Senator Obama seemed like the hope that we needed. We believed that we could get behind him. That was one time that I think that this country sort of looked the other way with race. They gave President Obama a chance. And they don't feel that they got what they bargained for. Right. And and I would say that it became more political because of the parties. Because one thing, it's very difficult for any administration to have major accomplishments. We can say that President Obama had a major accomplishment in health care. He's the father of health care in the United States, and that helped and is helping everyone across the country. And it's a problem when people negotiate against themselves and don't see that the health care was a good thing for them. And they allow politics to make them stand against Obamacare. It was so bad that we didn't want to say Obamacare, we wanted to say the Affordable Care Act, because you remember that people would say things like, I am against Obamacare, but I'm for the Affordable Care Act. And it, they both were the same. Right. And it was all about political language right yes. around that. And we haven't even seen that problem get lifted at all. And right. I know it was not meant to in just a few years. It was meant to be a long-term standing solution if it happened the way it was supposed to be laid out. And now it's in a totally different area. And I think disparately affecting communities, uh, vulnerable communities, yes. communities of color, communities of low income. And we see that just across the board. It seems like an assault almost on those communities. But, but, but before we go from yeah. there, we have to make sure that even the individuals that is not on Medicaid, the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act helped America itself because it took away life limits. Right. It took away pre-existing conditions. Those were huge. People that had 
asthma or diabetes or previously had complications with cancer, they couldn't be denied. They, they were denied before Obamacare, before the Affordable Care Act, but now everyone could get health care regardless of their condition. So people all over America are better off because of Obamacare. And I think that that has definitely been put on this a cost mm -hmm. lately. I don't think that a lot of people across this country think that that is the way they would have liked it to right. have happened because I don't know that everybody shares the values maybe that you and I do of that. Everybody deserves health care and views it as a right. And I think that that, that that kind of segues, too, into some of these other issues that we're facing. Right. So so we're, we're sitting here, we're in your office, mm -hmm. we're in Chicago, and one of the most complicated, especially complicated, uh, just, just across the board in its innateness and under-addressed issues is the issues of gun violence. Yes. So the gun violence issue in Chicago has crippled us economically, politically, socially, emotionally. And according to the Chicago Tribune, I believe it was October 8th, they came out and said that 419 people had been killed in Chicago so far in 2018, which is 132 deaths less than the previous year. And the majority of those victims, as we know, are young black men. Yeah. So, LaShawn, I'm curious as to how this has impacted your community. And I'd like for you to educate us on how the gun violence issues have evolved. Yeah. So, one, you have to ask yourself, how are all these illegal guns getting into the community. I mean, how could it be so easy to get a firearm? So I've worked with the um, railroads to try to stop the freight trains from being hit. You know, what they call it, whatever they, how people um, go and rob the freight trains of all those guns. So that's happening. People are getting these guns from freight trains, stealing them. I mean, boxes and boxes of them. So those are on the streets. People are bringing those guns on the streets. That's one. Two, we have our surrounding states. It's easier to buy guns in our surrounding states and bring them back to Illinois. Now, all that is criminal intent. It shouldn't happen. We can't make excuses for criminals, but what we have to do is take over the problem. We have to go straight where the problem is. And I know that you've made a major impact on the heroin and opioid crisis in Illinois and across the country. And I appreciate that. But we have to have that same person like you somewhere that's willing to shine a light on mental health in these communities. Because most people that's willing to kill someone, they probably have experienced death in their own lives because there's a belief that hurt people hurt people. It's true. And so that's, we can't, we have to recognize that the violence continues because people in these communities are experiencing it. And I'll tell you a story. I have a, a little cousin, and this is sad because he's probably eight years old. And he, first his mother was killed. And a year later, his father was killed and his wife. And so this little eight-year-old experienced the death of three people that he loved, and they're no longer around. And so his birthday came, and the family asked him, what did he want for his birthday? And he said, a gun. Profound. So this is generational. Yes. This is happening in the way that, that little two, three, four-year-old kids are seeing around them that this is the way. This, this is, is the, the way, way to go. Does that make it their fault? No, it does not. Right. So you have, what I'm hearing you say is that there is a, almost like a syndemic of mental health issues, cultural, yes. looking at who in the community is making the decisions about what you do with your life and viewing that and making it sort of idealistic, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is what I want from my life. And then you also have this issue of deep mental illness and addiction, and it's all working together at the same time. So I heard you would say, you know, you would mention that, you know, all the work we've done on heroin and mm -hmm. opioids. It almost seems like what I'm hearing you say too, is that if you're going to advocate, you have to shift your focus. You can't just do it the way that you've always done. Right. We have to change the entire model upon which we are choosing to address this issue. Yeah. You can't just one note it anymore. You have to really look at it holistically. And, and I think that that's why I really appreciate this time to talk with you because you said to me, you know, how can 
a white person from the suburbs help? What can we do to help you in the communities that you serve? And right. I think that's so major because what we see and what I hear from constituents, I think that they are kind of happy with the help, but it's not really getting to the root because what we have, we have lots of nonprofits coming into the communities. They're leading the quote reforms or the the help that's being provided to the communities and they have the communities working for them. They come with the agenda. Well, the communities that I represent say that we should be in charge of these programs because we know what's best. Mm -hmm. Stop letting them come into our communities telling us what we need. And for example, the reentry community. There are a lot of white organizations running reentry programs in the black communities. There are not black people running reentry programs. They're working for and they're giving directions on how they should run the program. So, that so has your to change. so your culture with your organization should reflect the communities that you serve. Well, let's just say let's just take a community that's not diverse and let's say that it's all white or a community that's all Hispanic or Asian. Okay, let's do Arlington Heights. Let's do Arlington Heights. Very white community. Very white. So what I'm going to do is I'm getting ready to gather some black people to come and set up a program in Arlington Heights to help white people with their problems. Without, right. yeah, so I don't know how that would work. It's a great question. Yeah. And I think that that's like the complicated dynamic that we're in right now. We're being forced to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, who are we? Right. And does it really matter if an African-American man is telling me how I should run my school right. or how I should run my grocery store? Or does it matter? And I think that what you're saying is it does, but it also, on the flip side, might not. It depends on where you, you you're are. You're right. And it, it will not matter, but you have to make sure that people have real access to decision making. Right. That's key. Blacks, whites, Hispanics, everybody have to work together because we could get there better if we're all working together with a plan to achieve the goal that we are all, you were talking about, we all want to see. We all want to see the end to senseless gun violence. We all want to see people living normal lives after being addicted to a substance. We all want to see healthy communities. Right. But we can't do it if we are not in it together. And so, but being in it together means understanding something that you've never understanding something that's new to you, right? So right. I'm just going to give you a quick example. Mm -hmm. So, black mothers are teaching their young sons how to avoid getting shot, right? right. And then you have white mothers, like my mother, growing up in Buffalo Grove, right. which is like one of the whitest communities you could get, right? Mm -hmm teaching me and my brother about how to just avoid interacting wow. with police, right. right? So you have two totally different conversations about how people interact with law enforcement in general. So I'm curious, you know, based on that, what would you tell your daughter? Yeah. And what do you think mothers and, and fathers should be explaining to their kids about how this is happening and the lessons maybe they can learn from that? So that's a really good question. What I tell my daughter is, Life is hard and it's going to be difficult, mm. but you can't complicate your life by making bad decisions. You have to stay in school. You have to do the best that you can so that when these challenges arise, you can deal with them. You can't throw yourself out of possibilities by not going to school, getting an education, being trained in something. That's so very important. And so even with society being unfair, you have to fight and you have to make sure that you do everything to get what's due to you. And society owes black kids as much as it owes white kids. And so I think that black people, brown people, everyone have to demand those special gifts that God gave us, you know, life, sure. liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Right. I think that that is so profound what you just said, because I know that the conversation that my parents had with me was not about how to achieve 
X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about how to get out of adversity. It was about how to live your life day to day and be a nice person. Yeah. The adversity related issues didn't really come up. I mean, right. it wasn't really until oh, I think good. 2003, 2004, when social media really had this big movement that we started to actually see this kind of like, uh, like this obstinance yeah. happen at these accelerated levels because it was like right in front of your face everything be was so hidden still you know what you're right i do have to tell my daughter that you know you're going to experience racism you yeah. know in fact wow. i ask her questions and a lot of times because they're young they don't understand what's happening to them but it's happening <laughs> you yeah. know and so you want to make them aware of what's happening in their lives and that way they could be able to deal with it. Right. And, and she's, and you know, that's our goal. She's at a school that's very, very diverse over in Oak Park, River Forest. So Great. that, that they, they just did a film or they're doing a series of things on that school. And so Star's doing a documentary on that school about racism. Wow. So it's a big deal. Wow. And that's what she's experiencing. You know, interestingly enough, I just did a training, a naloxone training for the Oak Park Library because they had a young man die of an overdose in their bathroom. Yes, I, and they I remember you equipped. did that, yes. And we came in there and just provided them with minaloxone, but I just thought that that was really interesting that the first thing that they thought is, well, we gotta fix this. Right. I thought, what a great, what a great move. So, I don't understand why we don't have, why people are still dying of overdoses, especially at the same rate when there is naloxone out there and that it's preventable. Well, know. why do you think that is? You know, because we haven't had more conversations like this and people, even our healthcare providers, I don't think they get it yet. There's totally. something to that that they don't get it. Well, also, let's take a look at how the media is portraying this still, that they are not covering the issues that are happening in the inner city of Chicago where you have mainly black and brown men dying from overdoses who are between the ages of 45 and 55 mm. in this community. And, and you aren't hearing that story. Right. We are still funneling out stories of what happens to white people in the suburbs still. That's just the truth. And I think that has a lot to do with the reason why potentially we aren't covering the issues with stop and frisk mm -hmm. and gun violence appropriately because we actually aren't elevating those stories appropriately. All you hear about on the nightly news is another eight young men just died. Right. And how, so now we're all right, right? Like this is all in our face. We're all getting numb to it. How do you change that? Yes, that's right. Because I think that we're just looking to report the bad news and the news is not really talking about how do we get here and how do we end this bad news? Right. I think they just want more of it. And so mm -hmm. I think that we have to, without a doubt, change, you know, that you said refocus and, and, and change and, and take it from expecting it to saying that this is not going to be happening anymore. And once we do that, once we help our society the way we help our families, you know, if our family is in trouble, we do everything that we can to help them. Right. And so I don't think society is like that. Society is waiting for trouble to happen instead of knowing that if we see 10 men on a corner, that's a red flag. There right. must be something that we need to go to to find out why are you standing on these corners? I mean, what's your life like? But it also seems to me, and I don't know how you feel about this, that nobody has really brought up an idea for how to end this. There right. hasn't really been exactly. like, like when you hear our governor and, um, and uh, J.B. Pritzker kind of going at it, you have these questions that come up, but no one will give you a straight answer. Like, how do we fix this problem? And so it pisses me off yeah. because guess what? I'm sick of hearing about right. the deaths. I don't want this to continue right. on. What do you think? I think that we, one, there is what you call best practices. And we, we know that we should make sure that communities that's doing well, mm -hmm. if we can have that same model in communities that seem to lose generations of people, which means that we have the same quality of education and opportunities for people to be successful in communities. We have a healthy setting in communities where drugs are not as available, where guns are not as available, where 
safety nets are there. So when kids leave, they could go to the park. They could go to the Boys and Girls Club. Or they could just stay at their school until 7 or 8 o'clock at night because there's just so much going on. That's not happening in communities where violence is high. And that's a problem. So we have to make sure that we fix that. So are you, are you alluding to it has to come from this prevention kind of standpoint? Like we need to start young we need to start in these schools we need to take a look at things like ace scores adverse childhood experiences looking at trauma looking at how that has to do with how that's translated to the world around a young person and then how that gets translated to how they behave as a human yeah every community and that's it seems like our educational system is a one-size-fit-all you're right and so when you have a community like arlington heights that has not experienced the same trauma you can't expect for the same model to work in Austin, in Lindell, in Inglewood, because you have to deal with the problems that these communities have created. For instance, you know, if you're from Arlington Heights and you are addicted to heroin and you go to a treatment and you come home, you're probably going to have a better chance at recovering. Maybe. Maybe, but guess what? Probably, but it's going to be much better than coming back to Austin or Inglewood where heroin is right outside your door. And there's not much else opportunity, right? So you're right. Like at least in Arlington Heights, you know, you have a place to go. Yep. You know that there's opportunity for you. You know, there's access. And it's going right? to be harder to get the heroin. You got to get on the highway, the heroin highway to come to Austin to get it. Yeah, right. And right. so, but in Austin, you leave the treatment right. center and it's right there waiting on you to come back home. So right. let's like Queen Gateway Foundation get... is right next to where right. the action is Isn't happening. Isn't that something? Amazing. Oh. And you know what? Their program is awesome. Right. I got to say that. They have yeah. a great program. Yeah. Um, but I think you're making the point. It's like, it's like, even if you could change your life, even if you made the decision, I'm not going to do this anymore. The, rel the relative likelihood of you having to renege on that is high. It's high. Because it's right in front yes. of your face. Right. And, and even if you want to be successful at a school and you're dealing with PTSD because your community is filled with these adverse situations, how are you going to go to school ready to learn? Totally. Because you're on the defensive mode yes. now. You're in survival mode. Yes. You're going into that school expecting, well, this is probably going to happen again. And yes. I'm, what's the point? I've just got to go back and deal with all yeah. these things logged in my hippocampus. Yeah. And, and, and I, mean, right. I can't focus on algebra when I just saw someone shot or when Absolutely. I my mother is um, unemployed, can't get a job. Maybe a child's mother is on some substance. Maybe a child's mother is experiencing just behavior health problems and not able to get the help because in the city of Chicago, the mayor shut down the mental health facilities. That's you, a problem. You have to have Chance the Rapper come in and to, save the day right. and give $100,000 right. to 10 organizations just to get it back up just and running to, and, again. And that, to me, that was just a public service announcement because 100000 right. for to give out grants it's going to, you know, that's just not enough. But thank you, Chance, for doing that. I think it's amazing. You want to hear something really interesting, yes. though? You take $100,000, and in communities like mine, where I come mm -hmm. from, that is one person's 30-day inpatient treatment in a treatment center oh. in Florida. Isn't that nuts? Oh, my Okay, goodness. right. So I just say that because it's like we have great outpatient programs here for various mental health issues, and it doesn't cost nearly that much. Right. You can treat, like... 15 to 20, maybe 30 people with that money for a year, yeah, which right. is amazing. So, so I think one of the other issues is right. So last week we had Jason Van Dyke, former police officer charged with second degree murder, 16 counts of aggravated battery for what he did to a yeah. McDonald judged by a jury of his peers. What type of vindication or change does that produce for this community? Does it help? You know, the life, and death of Laquan McDonald should never be forgotten. He should be and should always be remembered for changing Chicago and changing the world because it was really unfortunate. And what people in the community saw was a justice system that worked against all odds. You know, you have a strong defense put up by the FOP for Jason Van Dyke. 
even though it appeared to be an open and shut case. We saw Laquan walking away and we saw him get shot 16 times. That should have just been an open and shut case. But yet the system allows for you to put up a defense. And so the defense was put up and they tried to make Laquan look like he deserved what he got. So I think that it sends a message to law enforcement. It sends a message to the community and the world that our justice system can work. And and that's great. And then on the flip, you see what happened with this whole Kavanaugh situation. And you're thinking to yourself, yes. wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Let's back up a second. And then you realize we've got work to do. We, we have work we've to do. We've got work to and, do. And I'm we just do. so happy that the appointment to the Supreme Court did not deal with the criminal justice system. Had it been a part of the criminal justice system, it would have been difficult. So I'm very happy that the criminal justice system was tried and it worked, in my opinion. This one was political with the Supreme Court. And so that was all political, whether he was guilty of doing things to Dr. Ford or not, I don't know. But we have to make sure we draw the distinction, politics versus our justice system. Right. And seeing how, because the criminal justice system wasn't utilized in one of these cases, yes, it, how what that did right. and the divisiveness that it caused. I'm interested in what you have to say about this. So because of the fact that, let's face it, this podcast's audience are mainly white people right. who look like me, right. I want them to understand things that they're not going to hear from the media about what's going on right now in this community. What are some myths you'd like to dispel, even if it's just one or two? And what do you, what can you share with folks who look like me, how they can help really in a real way? Like, yeah, I think one, we could talk about the myths that black people really, really want to work with white people and not always work for white people. That's <laughs> right. so very important. Black people want to have a say in what happens in their life and work with white people to help make that happen. The myths of black people are lazy is just ridiculous. You know, black people every day, they go to work. You know, they struggle and they fight for their kids. You have black people sending their kids to private schools. That costs money. You have black people buying cars. That costs money, which means that they have to work. You have black people that own homes. How do they do that? Because they work. You have black people that's graduating from universities. How do they do it? Because they work and they, they go to school and they work hard to get their degrees. And so we have to make sure that we have these conversations like this. And once again, I appreciate you saying, how do we work together as whites and blacks so that we can better understand one another? I think that the myth that's out there is exactly that. And we have to make sure that we get to know each other. We have to become aware and not look at the media's perception of what one another's life is like. As you're talking, it's becoming profoundly sad to me that we have to teach ourselves basic facts about people just because they don't look like us. Right. It's so profound. And how we've been duped in a way by the party rhetoric, by the media, by all these different kinds of exposure, not to place blame on the media because I think that their motivation a lot of the time is ratings. Yeah. As, but, but you have this back to the basics, we must start somewhere else. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's profound to me. And, I, and I, how interesting, black people want to work Oh, with yes. white people, yes. not for them. Right. So right. simple. Right. Like, what, you know, but I think what I'm hearing you say is we need to include the people we we're trying to, to help. You know, and the myth of if I see a black person, I should be afraid. Oh. I mean, that's something wrong with that. I mean, it is something wrong with that we judge the book by the cover. And that's dangerous for people that do it because the person that you think might hit you over the head may not be the one that's going to hit you over the head. That person could save you. And the other person that you expect to be your protector could be the one that harmed you. 
And so that being said, mm-hmm. you, we have to make sure that we protect ourselves by being fair in our thinking and not judge a book by its cover. You know, it's unfortunate. Even me as a state representative, as I could have on a suit, still, there is still some bias towards me. Right. Like, there's got to be something going on. Yes. Like, you're corrupt right, in some way. Right. But you know what's interesting, though? And I think this might be just ingrained in me. And I think we have to recognize, too, that a lot of this, like, white privilege stuff, these prejudice, this prejudice stuff comes from a lot of the way we're trained. So as I was driving down here, I locked my car. Yeah. Okay? I did. Because that's how I was trained to lock you as down. a white girl from the right. suburbs to right. lock my car and protect my stuff right. and protect my things. In an environment where See, it's questionable. Now, now Does I'm that glad, make me racist? That doesn't make you racist. It makes you sort of vulnerable. Because if you don't lock your doors everywhere, you're vulnerable because where you could get hurt because you put your guards down is right. where you might get hurt. Well, I do lock so them So lock everywhere. them everywhere. But was the reason that I did it different from the reason I might do it by my office or my house? I don't know. I'll if you, if you, now you have to watch it and see. If you lock them everywhere, then you didn't do anything differently. Yeah. But if you lock them deliberately because you were moving into an area, then I can't say that it's bad because crime happens around here because you have a high unemployment. Certainly. And right. so there is a chance that something could happen to you. But that same possibility can happen anywhere. Oh, yeah. There was a guy down the street from my house the other day who killed four people. See? I know. Right. right? So exactly. So that's what we have to recognize. But if that, we don't ask these questions right. and have these discussions, we are never going right. to get it. Right. And I, we're never going to get and it. And you have to tell white people, we have to do everything to to work and help our brothers and sisters of different persuasions. Your life is going to be better when your brothers and sisters of different races lives improve. So if I'm living my best life, everyone's living their best life, your life is going to be improved. But if you are allowing the top 1% that's controlling the narrative with all the money to divide us based on race, we're all going to fail. And because that's what's happening. It's the money people that's putting the divide with racism and guns and things like that when we're all struggling to survive and have that happy life. Right. So maybe the lesson there is do your due diligence when you're actually voting. Yes. We have an election coming up. Yes. Midterms. Yes. It's going to be insane. You know, I have have a prediction that's probably different. I, I would say that it appears that the Democrats are poised to win the mansion back um, from Bronner. But I think that if JB doesn't do something to mobilize the black community and get the vote out, I believe that we can have a second term of Bronner. Yes. Because what I'm seeing from all of the conservative podcasts yeah. I listen to, because I have to, right. right, in order to be informed and understand how to do policy work. right i don't know it's going to be that easy to sell people outside of the city on that that's right or even some people inside of the city are people coming out i mean i don't know if the republican party is going to throw the baby out with the bathwater based on Ronner's position on abortion you know he signed the bill right. but the question is are they going to give are they going to stay at home or are they going to come out and make sure the republicans win i think the democrats are expecting Ronner's base to be gone mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then Ronner will lose. But I'm thinking that the Republicans are playing footsie with uh, Ronner and they're going to um, come out and vote. We should never undermine them just because we're hearing that the Democrats are fired up. We should never, ever rest on those laurels. Well, I hope you guys do rest. (laughs) <laughs> we will. We will. And I hope you guys rest. As Democrat, I, you're, I'm hoping that the Democrats win. And as yeah. Republicans, they're hoping that the um, Republicans win. And I know you're um, nonpartisan. We believe at Live for Lolly that all people deserve their rights to be heard, that their rights to be met. We believe that drug users have rights. That's right. And, and they do. Because they're people. The they're not just drug users. They're people. Is I mean, there, come on now. Is there a Bill of Rights for um, a, addiction? A Bill of Rights? 
I don't know. There you go. Now you you can um, work on that. That's a really good point. Like, what is what are the rights? So there's a great union down here called the Drug Users Union. Right. And we're and you know with without them, we don't know that things like you know needle exchanges, and right. Methadone and safe consumption sites. God forbid I even bring it up because it seems like every time I do, I get accosted. Yeah. Um, might work because they're harm telling reduction. us that it works. Yeah, harm, harm reduction. Yes. And there's harm reduction with gun violence, right. like all these other issues too. Why are we ignoring these things that need to happen? So, so, so I think that that's you want to do. You want to do a bill of rights for um, this? I can. Will you? Help I'll me? work with you. Okay. <laughs> so I have a question. So yeah. that they know there's a, there's something called naloxone. Yeah, sure. And people, everyone should have it, like a smoke detector in their house. What's the new point? that we're trying to get out about naloxone. That if you don't have a pulse, you can't recover from an overdose. Don't be afraid of naloxone. We yeah. pass lots of laws to make it very yeah. able for you to have it. So I think the last thing that I think, if you know someone that's addicted to a substance like heroin, you should have a kit. And the Surgeon General came out actually a couple months ago and said that everybody should actually yep. have naloxone on right. them because you're more likely to encounter an overdose right now than you are will likely to encounter um, a fatal car crash, a suicide, a homicide in this country. We should all be carrying it. And so I do encourage that. I know you don't think you should, but you know, in order to change the tide of this, we all have to be working together to save lives. And that means stepping up for your fellow yeah. man, brother or sister to do that. Yep. You know, you're the first one to teach me about naloxone. Just so I you know. know. <laughs> and you're the I'll first take credit one. for that. Yep. Note. All right. Thank you for accepting it and yes. calling attention to the issue. And Lashawn, it was so good to oh, talk to you. Oh, it was great. I learned Thank a you. lot. I yes. always learn a lot yes. from you. But, but I'm telling you, this is so very important that we have these conversations and we join forces as a humane society to make sure that we fix the problems for our brothers and sisters. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Party should never come in place of that. Party, race, or beliefs should never come in the way of humanity. No. It's, it, it goes against everything yes. that both parties stand for, right. actually. Right. So, all right, cool. Well, all thank right. you for thank being you. so honest. If substance use in any way impacts you, you are not alone. Help and support are available. Live for Lolly is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to providing support, safety, and education for patients and families impacted by substance use disorders and other mental health conditions. For information or help, please visit us at liveforlolly.org or on any of our social media channels. Call 844-584-5254. Five four or email us at info at liveforlolly.org.